Two weeks ago, we began a a new sermon series for the, the season of Advent. We talked about the fact that Christmas is, at its very simplest expression, the birth of a very special child. I talked about the fact that this was something that I had lost sight of over the years. I'd gotten disillusioned with the commercialism. I'd even got a bit disillusioned with the religion over the people that showed up only at Christmas time. And so it was 10 years ago, Kyla's pregnancy with Molly, which was nearing its due date at this time of year, that really enabled me to recapture that simple celebration of birth. And so this year, this week, we are continuing to look at the season of Advent through the lens of expectation, the expecting of a child. Last week was anticipation, next week will be agitation, or excuse me, Christmas Eve will be agitation, Christmas Day, celebration. And today, We are talking about preparation. Now, anyone that's ever had a baby knows that there is a great deal of work that goes into preparing for a child, right? I remember one of my least favorite parts was getting the crib and the furniture together. Now, I might have have mentioned this before, but I honestly believe flat pack furniture to be the work of the devil. It's a little known fact that 40% of all divorces can be traced back to the words, honey, let's go to Ikea. (laughs) Kyla and I knew that the two of us assembling this crib would be a disaster. But it was a two-person job, so I I recruited a gentleman in our church at the time by the name of John Hargrove to, to help me out with putting together this crib. Now, John was literally a master woodworker. He was newly retired. He had spent all his career in construction doing detailed woodwork. And so I asked him to do this, and he said it would be absolutely no problem. We would have this thing knocked out in just a half an hour or so. It took took the better part of a day. The directions were vague and confusing. The diagrams were useless. And this was one of just a hundred things that needed to be done before a new baby could arrive. Now, Kyla had recently moved into panic mode. I think think some uh, psychologists or doctors call it nesting. I called it panic mode. She looked at all the things that we didn't have done for Molly's arrival. And I tried to assure her that everything would be okay, that that everything would be done, but she was really convinced that Molly would end up sleeping in a shoebox or something (laughs) like that. This is not Molly. I took this off the internet. Please do not call child services on me. But joking aside, there were things that needed to be done. The crib had to be assembled, clothes had to be washed, Molly's room had to be gotten ready. There was a lot for us to do as we prepared for the big day that we knew was coming soon. It is very similar in our preparing for Christ. Now, last time when I talked about our first Sunday in Advent, I talked about how Advent has a dual purpose. How it prepares us for the celebration of Christmas. But it also prepares us for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus promised his disciples that someday he would return. As a matter of fact, the entire story of the Bible, both Old Testament and New, points toward this day. If we go all the way back to the book of Genesis, we see God created a perfect world. 
And it was only through the disobedience of Adam and Eve in the garden that sin and death entered the world and disrupted our relationship with God. And so from the beginning of Genesis onward, the story of the Bible is the restoration of this relationship. The restoration of the world. Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection began this restoration. But we're told that it's not completed. It's not finished. And Paul writes that not only human beings, but all of creation is groaning in anticipation of this day when the work will be completed When God will come and restore the world to the way he truly planned it to be. Last time I talked about how this is not to be a scary image. And it's unfortunate that books like the Left Behind series or even disaster movies have painted a a grim picture of Christ's return. But the original idea was that Christians were to pray for, to hope for this day. It was not to be a day of death and destruction, but a day of rebuilding and renewal. A day for hope and peace. And not only were Christians to to pray for this day, but they were to prepare for this day. Peter tells us in our scripture this morning that since this purification is to come in the future, that we must lead lives of holiness now. We are called to make the present age a place where righteousness is at home, even as we wait for the new heavens and the new earths that are to follow. This second coming of Christ should be a motivation for us. A motivation to live a holy life. To live a life that is apart from the world. But pointing toward God. A life that is to be pointing toward God. And there's one interesting word here that Peter uses. And that's the word hasten. This word implies that we have work to do. That waiting is not a passive thing. That we are not to just spend our days wringing our hands at the state of the world and praying that God comes quickly to change it. Instead, as F.B. Meyer wrote, it's not enough to say, thy kingdom come. He said, each day we should move some pebble from its pathway. This morning, we get to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. Holy Communion has long been seen by Christians as a time not only of of communing with God, of getting closer to God, but preparing our hearts for God. Confessing our sins. Acknowledging that we need God in our lives. And acknowledging that He has given us work to do. Work that we have to carry out so that we can be prepared for His kingdom to truly come.